correct. So we're going to look at the results now. So this is uh, one of the images that we have there. Yeah. Okay. What do you notice about these images? The beards aren't in half anymore. <laughs> what what is it similar about them? The eyes. The eyes are very similar, right? That's true. The nose is also pretty similar. All right. No? That's, that's interesting. Uh, let me... This is not working, so can you have it? Yes. I mean, I guess they're not that, so it should be now. They, they, they could be related, right? They look like family somehow. Yeah, I mean, you don't have like a very thin, trim nose. Like, it's not a massive category shift. Is it working now? Uh, yes. So, but the eyes, for sure. So let's, let's first talk about how they are measuring the, the results. So they are using something called the Freche Inception Distance. Who is familiar with this? And you have to be deep in the game. Right? So, basically, <laughs> so basically, the Freche Distance is a way to measure the distance between, between two Gaussians. Between two distributions. So what they are doing here is they are taking the images that are generated by the generator, and they are running them through an inception version three network, and they are taking the activation of the pool three layer. So this is a vector with 2,048 elements, and then when you keep repeating this for every generated image, then you have a sense of that high dimensional Gaussian what it looks like. All right. And then you do the same with it, with actual images from these two curated data sets of real images. Then you take 50,000 random images and you do the same, and then this gives you a distribution of activations of the inception network, and then you compare these two Gaussians. It is expected that when the distance is lower, that means that the images are more real, or in other words, they represent better the distribution that you get from the, in these two data sets. And when you look at the numbers, this is, remember that we started building this architecture step by step. So step A, we just have the baseline progressive gain. Then we change the bilinear, uh, sorry, we change the upsampling. So using the nearest tables, we use bilinear upsampling. Then uh, we add the mapping and the style. This is the linear, the affine transform that is marked as A, that is uh, feeding the style into the synthesis network. So that A is uh, the mapping here. And the style that is the, once we, we bring that, um, so we have to go back. So this, once we bring this and this, that's this C. And then we remove the traditional input and then replace it for that big block of constant, which is a constant forever. And then we add the noise inputs, and then the last step is mixing regularization, which I'm going to talk about now. But before I do that, please notice that by doing all these incremental steps, then the FID starts decreasing. These are very good FID scores, though, just to be clear. Yes, but they are very tricky about how they measure it. Yeah. Because they said that they take the minimum over a number of uh, uh, trials. Yeah. So, of course, if I keep flipping the coin, eventually I'm going to get a good result. Yes. But this, that, that is also common in the literature. It's a problem, yeah, but it's I common. Know. I know. It's like we cannot do any better, so I'm going to do that as bad as the other research groups. So. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> Sorry, what, what is D? D? We remove the traditional input. So instead of having a latent code, we put a constant, remember? Oh, you're just adding that. That's what we are calling the okay. traditional input, okay. right? So we have that big block at the beginning that serves as the anchor for the first adenine operation. Yeah. So you see, it works. It reduces the, the FID. So this is, if you're going to remember something from this talk, please remember this slide. So this is the way that actually works. So remember I told you that I was going to call this styles. So here we go back here. I told you that these were images. Remember when I said that? So, okay. So, so what we are doing here, what they are doing, is that they are taking these two images that are real and exist, and these are real people. They pass those images through 
this network and they obtain a code for each one of them. Okay? So they take these two images of real people and they obtain a code. And then what they are doing is the green image here is fed here at the beginning of the synthesis. And the second image, or the second style, or the second code is fed later on. So depending on where you fit that second image, then you're going to have a mix, a mixing of styles. So if you mix these two real images of real people, you obtain, you obtain this image that looks really, really good. And this works because of the way you are combining the information that is contained in those styles. At the end of the day, the network learns what uh, uh, a head pose means, or, uh, what a uh, color of the eyes uh, is. And the hair is curly, is, uh, no, it's not curly. Like all those uh, elements of information are properly encoded in the different canvas that we have. The same way with the skin color, with the color of the background, and whatnot. So, so is it correct to say A focus on global, B focus on local? So these are examples. Actually, we have three different slides to explain, to answer to your question. Uh, yes? Is it the same as morphing, morphing photos? Mm. In, in a way. In a way it is because you can, you can determine where in the synthesis you're going to replace that uh, word. So remember we have W, let's call W encode or the word W standing you for word standing for W. So you start with a word that is the green word that it says, and at some point you replace it, depending on where how how far in the synthesis process you have gotten, then the effect of that second word is going to be minimized or maximized. Right? So you start with one style and then you switch it halfway through the process. And this is what we see here. We have the source and we have the destination. So these images are encoded into that, those W that are going to be fed to the network. And at some point, in this case, uh, in the first layers, because here we're talking about the coarse styles. So when you fed that second word at the beginning of synthesis, then it's going to have a big effect in the overall architecture of the result. So note then, what the difference between source and destination here, the only difference is that the source style is being injected prior, not in a statistical sense, but prior, like earlier than the destination. Because technically, it could go right up to the second last thing, and it would still be the source. And then as long as their destination is the last possible stuff. So it's just source, the ordering. Source and destination the, is where you are injecting it during the imaging, image synthesis process. So basically just the source is affecting the large features and the destination, the fine features. Depending on where you inject that second one. It's just the so order. In this example, in this example, we are going, this particular example, this is the first part of the table that they show, they are injecting that second word earlier. So in, in the first, um, so in the first layers, in the first convolutional layers of the scene. Okay, so I'm, I'm not even right at all. Then <laughs> you're saying they they inject it earlier, so then ordering has nothing to do with it. So you start. So okay, let's see. So this is four by four. This is eight by eight. Yeah. And you know you can go down to one twenty four by one twenty four. <laughs> so what I mean earlier is between. Oh, oh, sorry, between I see. Four by four, uh, between, before they get to, say, I don't know, uh, 64 yes. by 64, that's everything. But, but the source is still done yet earlier still. The source <laughs> is going to be the first one. Just the first one. And journey. you can keep the source here, here. For all you care, you could have the same green yeah. source so no. here and here and here. And at some point, you flip the, you flip the word. So I was right. I stand by my <laughs> So these are, so you, so, sorry, just let me finish and then I go back to you, because I've been trying to. Yeah, sorry. <sighs> okay, so we have this word, and we start the network with this word, right? This is the first style that goes after that big block of cement. That's the first one that we input, and at some point, during synthesis, we're going to replace it. And in these examples, we are replacing that word earlier. So before we get to, I don't know, 64 by 64. 
and actually in the video, you look at the video, they have the effect of the mix of, of the two different styles at different levels. So this is the coarse level, this is at the beginning, in the first layers where it's flipping the, 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 the word. And then you can see that you have this uh, style is going to greatly influence, greatly influence the original style. So you see really, really big differences when you, uh, for instance, you take this man here and then you affect the style with this style and then you see this style is highly, highly, highly modifying the result. Okay? Look at head pose, for instance. So you have, um, so there is no mar another variation here, but you can see here uh, the color, for instance, the color of the skin is something that is coarse that happens here. The color of the skin and also the background. Because we are inputting this area between the synthesis, then this style is controlling greatly the color of the skin and the background, for instance. In fact, you're so, you're, that's so much true. <laughs> that's a nonsense sentence, but that is so true that the hair, if you look on the far edge one, like the far, the furthest one to the right, the hair is actually informing the background, even though technically that guy has short hair. That's probably the hair from that second image. Somehow it knows that there really shouldn't be hair there, but because there, maybe there's a dark background there, or who knows what, it's actually trying to build the background. It normally skips a generation. Do you normally skip a generation? <laughs> okay, so I want to move to the middle styles. So in this case, we have the same source, it's probably the same word. And instead of injecting that second word early, we wait until the middle style. So in the paper, sorry, I, I, I should have posted it here on the slide, but it's, uh, uh, they tell you in the paper uh, the, the, the kernels where they are doing this. But it's much later. It's like right in the middle of the synthesis process, you are going to do this. And here you can see, for instance, that, and like in the previous case, the style is not informing the background a lot. So you see that it's a mix of the background here. Also here you can see, sorry, let me go back here. For instance, the, the example of the glasses here. So the glasses are preserved here. This is a feature that is not global. And here it's not preserved, right? So this a style is a middle level style and then it removes the glasses here. Here, this have glasses, this has glasses, but it's a middle feature, so it kind of changes these glasses with these glasses. So you start looking at, at to, you pay attention to how this style modifies the original style, and then it, it kind of makes sense. I noticed in the previous one, gender is largely preserved from the source, according to the next one. Yes, uh, let's preserved. see. Uh, yes, so you're right, here gender is it's highly influenced by the by the by the sort of destination. So here gender, yeah. That, that that in this case gender would be a middle excuse me, middle style. And then you look at the at the point where you switch the word right at the end of the synthesis process. And you can see here that uh, in this case That's really weird actually. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so, so we're any this is hmm? just changing this is affecting this style with you know small features of, of the input. I, I, I don't understand this to me. It all it, it looks like the final layers are very, very dominant is what that would be. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. texture. Like so here, this is the slide I wanted to show you. So when you inject the style, the core styles are injected in between four and eight. So this is four by four, eight by eight. So the first two layers. Then you have 16 by 16 to 32 by 32. And the five styles from 64 by 64 to 124 by 124. So if you inject Fine styles in a number because this this range is way larger than these two ranges here, right? That's true. So maybe that's why that those fine styles uh, affect the most. If you go back, the fine style affects most of the synthesis because you have a much higher number of kernels here. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't know. Affecting the results. So in any case, remember these are real images, and you just have a smart combination of styles. Mm. So this network is more about combining styles. 
rather than synthesizing something from scratch. So it's, it's a significant improvement over the traditional GAN generator because now we have a structure. Now we can have those gates that tell us how to combine intelligently different features. Now we have a way to get the colors and the strokes of one particular style and use them by you know, combining them at different um, levels of resolution. Also, a, a big contribution is to separate the, the high-level features that you get by these kernels from stochastic noise. So that gated noise allows us to model things such as the hair, the wrinkles, the reflection of the sun on your skin, things that are very that otherwise would be really badly modeled by kernels. And finally, this network, in my opinion, doesn't do synthesis from scratch. The main important thing is that you take real images and you know how to combine them to produce images that are really, really good. And so in a way, if you look at the manifold of possible uh, in faces, you are interpolating in a, in a very, very smart way to obtain data points that you didn't have before. Uh, now, about talking about discussion points. So, one of the uh, discussion points that arose during our conversation was where this type of structure, this type of technology would be applicable other than to generate faces. So we, we said, for instance, that this could be applicable in advertising. So you know you have a, a brand identity and you go to your customer and then here there's A, B, and C, which one do you like the most? And then you have a very intelligent way to produce very quickly a marketing material that is appealing to your customers. Another possible application would be in literature. So if you replace the idea of a face with the idea of a novel, and the different levels, the hierarchical levels of those features could be the style that the author applies to the novel. Is it mystery or is it sci-fi? Do we use long sentences or would we use short sentences? Is there dialogue or is there a monologue? Uh, what type of adjectives do we, do, do we use to describe the, the scenes and the different situations? So this could be a, an interesting application. Uh, something that probably would hit more home for me is uh, applications in neurosurgery or in sur uh, surgery in general. Think of dexterity as a hierarchical uh, level of motion. So you, we know that in robotics we have kinematics and there are large motions, we have positioning, we have targeting. There are different types of uh, manipulations. Uh, maybe doing it hierarchically means that we could have robots that could do microsurgery now because we have the dexterity. We have now the dexterity to, to model those minor interactions that we didn't have before. Um, we also talk about the, how curious and how particular is the, that big block of cement. So the way I analyze it is that it's just the anchor to the first ADA in operation, but this is something that probably requires, uh, you know, <coughs> there's, there's going to be a, a, a different explanation perhaps. This is the way I rationalize it, but they, in reality the authors don't provide a lot of uh, information about this block other than saying that they found out that it doesn't really affect their, their network. So I think my explanation, at least this is the way I can go to bed and know, knowing that I can't sleep because you know, I have an explanation for it. But maybe there's another explanation. Maybe there's a better mathematical model for it. So, um, um, just to extend that point, uh, one of the discussion points that, that uh, we were talking about was, okay, so uh, the idea of the constant tensor is, is basically a new thing, and uh, it, it drew a, a lot of interest. Um, so uh, would it make sense to concatenate fixed random tensor slices uh, onto multiple layers of the network instead of it just being uh, there for the, the origin of the generator? Would it make sense to have uh, constant slices as uh, one way of thinking of it as uh, <laughs> being like fresh play available to later layers. Uh, if, if we think of that uh, first constant tensor as being like unmolded play that is used for later layers to uh, modify, would there be any benefit um, 
to, uh, to repeating that, but in later layers through concatenation. So uh, another one is uh, mixing styles. Is that really necessary? And the, so the first one we had here was the constant tensor is very interesting innovation. Does it train? What is its contribution? And so we've discussed that uh, a little bit here uh, in terms of uh, basically being the anchor for the generator. Um, the next point here is the add in operator is remarkably simple and unexpectedly powerful. What do you guys think? Uh, guys and girls, what do you think? Can What? The, the add in operator. So it's uh, surprisingly simple, uh, <coughs> but very powerful. Uh, what do you guys, uh, guys and girls think? You know something, you know something that comes to mind in, in observing this is uh, cellular mitosis. <laughs> okay. So sure, why, why is that, right? Well, you that. See, so you're basically splicing something and then making something bigger. And in combining all of those things, it is it ultimately expresses like you know creating a person or something like that. So that's what I see, and I see something like the like the in as the core. Um, uh, how can I say the core function of creating that expression by doing like the sequencing of the chromosome. Like so, in other words, you look more like mom, you look more like dad. You know what I'm trying to say? That's what I see. Well, I think that's uh, so you're, 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 you're almost say, you're, you're thinking of cellular mitosis in the sense of like, you have some genetic properties and right. I'm blending them in some intelligence. That's right, way. in a sequence, in a particular sequence, which will create some kind of expression, right? Yeah, sure, I, I dig it. <laughs> I just see it, I see the result, and we're just kind of like going backwards. That's, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, tying it into maybe the add in stuff. I mean, one of the I know I know the covariate shift thing is is an interpretation of what batch normalization is doing. But one of the uh, there's another interpretation espoused by Goodfellow, who is the original GAN guy, right? And that is that it actually is just simplifying parameterization, right? Uh, so you're instead of making it so that you have to in theory control the overall variance of all of these different parameters individually, right? parameter by parameter by parameter, you have a dial, effectively, that allows the network to go, actually, we want, in general, the thing to have higher variance, right? So what's happening here, then, with, with the in operation is that you're, 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 you're now making that dial not one value, but per, like, like parameterizable, at least in terms of W, right? At least per channel. Per, per channel, parameterizable, it's not just per channel, it's per channel, Per hierarchical layer, per like, or between each convolutional layer, like, like there's, right? But you're you're adding all of these, like, basically, you could almost imagine as like, just like you're saying in terms of mitosis, you're adding all of these um, tunable points in the network, which, as depending on how you change, like, with the mix in, is varying all of this interesting structure. Right? Does that make sense to anyone? It sense to me. Yeah. Yeah, I think that. Uh, the way I rationalize it is yes, it's simplifying training and it kind of makes sense because if you didn't have batch normalization, then the network somehow would need to model into the ways that require normalization. So if you re or you have that because it has some sort of bias. Say for instance that you had um, you have black and white images and for the most part your images are mostly white. So there is a kind of a shift towards white, right? So in order for the network to be efficient at doing some sort of classification, inside the ways you need to model that normalization to make it less wide and more centered, right? Now you're going to take batches. So when you take batches, you have this gamma and this beta that is going to be estimated over all the batches, right? So by doing it by batch, you can have those two parameters that are going to center they are going to normalize your input regardless of what error bias you have in your input. So instead of doing it one by one or not doing it at all, when you do it by batch, it's, it's faster. So that kind of explains why you get better, faster training with batch optimization. And, and similarly, you can see, even with, in, with the way we're handling the noise, we've teased out yet another piece of what the actual architecture is doing. Now, before, we had to vary the mean and variance without batch normalization as a whole channel individuals uh, uh, value by individual value we fix that with batch normalization 
by adding the noise, we've teased out the piece of, of individual variation across those things. Um, so now we can actually inject the variation um, separately. The network no longer has to produce that variation individually. It can just leverage that variation and, and express it however it needs to in the actual network. Okay? So these are like weird, could potentially be very deep, insightful. Uh, 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 Nothing. Sorry, now if you know the following, this generator doesn't have pasteurization. At all. Right? At all. And why it makes sense that it doesn't have it? Think of what the generator is actually doing. And what would happen if you had it. Remember that we are mixing styles. So it is very important. You saw what happened when we flip from batch normalization to instance normalization. The style is better transferred. Do you remember that? Yes. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to that. Four photos. Here. So when we do instance normalization, the style, the style is better transferred. All right. Now we're taking one step further, and now we have an instance normalization where you don't need to learn any parameters. We're actually transferring the statistics of our style directly onto whatever canvas we have. So it makes sense that we don't have batch normalization. Because if we had batch normalization, remember that we would have a batch of styles, and then we would have to calculate statistics for a batch of styles, and we don't want that. We want to capture the statistics for the style that we're trying to transfer. So this makes sense. You would basically erase the style. It wouldn't make any sense. <laughs> OK. Um, yeah. Um. My question is kind of a continuation, but in an opposite direction. So okay. yes, batch normalization is great. And being able to tie out, so we pieced out the batch normalization, made use of it in a different way. And we also, one should remember, we also are building on top of a convolutional neural net architecture that describes the underlying space extremely well. Mm -hmm. So you had an example with novels. How would you do that with novels? Without, well, maybe with convolutions, but how would you do that? Convolutions wouldn't necessarily make sense, but how? Uh, well, I, I, full disclaimer, I don't work in NLP, but I, I am aware of uh, algorithms such as Globe that allow you to encode um, uh, sentences, I believe. You have words and then sentences. So imagine of a hierarchy of structure where you can encode paragraphs or you know that could be the initial building blocks to do it to do this and now you could extract from different examples of paragraphs the idea of a style so you could mix styles you could have a paragraph that is a thriller paragraph and you have a lot of action words in that paragraph and fights and explosions and blah 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 right and then you can have a very bucolic paragraph that describes the beauty of the countryside living so if you mix styles at that level of abstraction, you could have a bucolic explosion in the countryside. <laughs> in theory, I, but, but like, it's, it's a good question because I don't think at this stage we can map this kind of framework to anything else, really. To be completely honest, we we well, can, yeah. or except at least yeah, you can. at the University of Waterloo is actually doing that, and they're kind of following the same idea. They have this vector representation. I told I, I told them everything they need. <laughs> <laughs> so part of that vector representation captures the semantics and the content of that text, and the other part is focused on capturing the style, and that's the basic idea behind um, yeah. their approach. Yeah, the, it wasn't to say that you can't capture style and text. The the point is just that this like this is the progressive GAN, which is the underlying framework, yeah. doesn't trivially map into any other domain yeah. that isn't images. That's maybe, all I was trying to say. I mean, we know the progressive stuff. So th that's actually another point here. Um, the the group that developed this paper, as was mentioned earlier, uh, is the same group that came out with the progressive GAN paper. And uh, progressive GAN is just a training method that is more efficient and tends to be more stable. Uh, so I guess one of the questions is, is it actually necessary to use progressive training uh, for this architecture? Mm -hmm. And I think the, 
the answer is no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, you would expect nothing less from that group anyway to, to be doing that. Um, to be able to train high resolution images like that, uh, you would need a, a stable discriminator so it doesn't collapse. Uh, and you would probably also need a, a little bit more time. But in terms of the, like in terms of training time, but in terms of development time, setting up a pro progressive GAN setup takes a long time to implement. It's yeah, it, it's not trivial. So if you can, say, uh, tolerate the additional training time, it might be good just to skip the progressive stuff entirely and uh, go directly to uh, Look, and my, my contention the, is the that base. training a progressive GAN is more complicated than training not a non-progressive GAN. Yeah. So yeah. why do we do it? Because we're NVIDIA and we already did it. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. So what's the computational cost of something like this? I have no idea. What, what's the, what, do you, what do you mean? What do you mean the computation cost? Uh, like how how how, how yeah. big a system do you need? Like the big system and time. The rig you're model. using is over 200k to buy. You mean like the, the like the theoretical big O complexity, or you mean just like overall computational cost, like you know uh, time cost uh, hardware a wall clock. Uh, so I'm sorry. I didn't the, the Nvidia rig they're using is is insane. Like it's, oh, it's, if, if I'm not mistaken, they may only be using one of the cores on it, but the rig itself is a, ser is a server that's designed. It's the TSX whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Or the PGX whatever. Six million. Yeah, it's part. It's, it is actually worth maybe mentioning this that this is partially an ad for their hardware. Right? <laughs> right? Right. It's, it's not clear to me that I think I think one of the guys from Logo Joy tried to actually, or did you actually tried to implement it as well, and yeah. your batch size ends up being one long before you reach 1024 by 1024 normal graphics card. You know. okay. So I, I did it for 1D data though, and so uh, like memory requirements are, are much lower in that case, so I was able to do batch sizes of 512. Okay. Uh, but when you go to like high resolution 1024 by 1024, like megapixel yeah. images, uh, and doing those in, in batches, uh, the, the memory requirements go through the roof at that point. Yeah. And so, Here it says that it was one week on an NVIDIA DGX1 with eight Tesla V100 DPS. So these are, these are ridiculous uh, hardware requirements. So uh, going back to the constant, would it make sense to use that to condition the network? Let's say you had images of people of like, different age brackets, and you pass in some kind of you know, one hot that tells you if you're in, in, you know, if you're in like 5 to 10 or like 10 to... It's not, it's not a one hot at all, right? But, like, would that be how, how would you condition it? So what would you put there to condition it? Because what, what, what we saw, what David saw is that that first convolution, there is nothing there. Like it's not, you know, it's the bias, it's an anchor, it's not really learning much from that input. The, the, the constant tensor itself didn't change. Uh, but the, I, so I, I didn't try visualizing the first convolution. Oh, error. okay. Yeah. okay. Um, so, I mean, it's an interesting question. What, like, basically, what uh, when I when I think about conditioning stuff, what you're what you're basically telling the network is you're saying um, uh, you're setting flags that allow the same network parameters to operate in different ways, right? Um, at least as it as it stands right here, um, the network does seem to be able to learn very very complex data distributions without any conditioning. So you would have to sort of show that there's some gain, or, or your data distribution is so complicated, maybe if it was had more than one face in it, or something like that, that having those flags um, is somehow simplifying what the model needs to learn. I think that's the, the challenge. However, I did want to add that one of my questions, uh, or one of, my, one of the discussion points I raised was actually the way that they're using the style, style, that, that's another discussion question, but the way, the way that they're actually using those style injections starts to actually look a little bit more like conditional uh, conditional uh, variables because you're so you're you constantly parameterizing at every <laughs> twice like, like that your actual input is that image that we call in style right mm -hmm. so you're conditioning what it was going to do because sure. you have a block of nothing and then you have all the style information coming from this image that is a real image so yes it's like heavily conditioned yes. Uh, but it's not a one-hot vector. Okay. It's a continuous space. Yeah. Right. I still don't buy that Z is the input because for for two reasons. One, one is in the paper they said both set to five twelve. 
type 12. Uh, for simplicity, we said a dimensionality. The dimension. Of the second is. Uh, so, oh, yeah, so the dimension is 512. So, that, what is that 16 by 16? 64 by 64, right? So you can okay, have, have a second that point. Is the, so that if, is the, if, you, if you look at this, 32 by 32 is 7. Okay. Yeah. If, if you look at this, like this is this is sort of like exploring the latent space, so, like with the same image. So then there is some variation. So my question is, if Z is not the 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 the, the, the variation, so where does this variation come from? It comes from the noise channel. Uh, unfortunately, the jury's going to be out on the on this one. I I I also I think that it's not an image, but it's even weirder if it's not an image, right? Okay. <laughs> well, think about it. if if it isn't an image, that means somehow that latent vector is encoding all of the information of each of those images, all of the style information it is learning from scratch. Well, it's it's it a is, much crazier claim. It is encoding like you have eight fully convolutional layers, so you have a a good approximation of a code from, from the layers. It's probably not, you know, if you had more layers... Or no, no, uh, I'm saying if, if, <coughs> that, if, if Z wasn't an image, it's just a, the, the paper is just that much more impressive, right? Because it means that they learned all the style from scratch. Well, it could also be the case that, that Z is coming from somewhere else. Sure. Right? And uh, so but, but the way they refer to the Z, and when you look at the results, it, it makes you believe that no, it is an uh, image. So that, 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 that's, I think, very interesting. Um, so we were talking earlier about uh, how would you use this to, say, write a story, for instance. And you're mentioning that that Z could be anything you want. It doesn't have to be noise. It could be uh, mm -hmm. some type of encoding, maybe from a prior layer. Uh, as a discussion point, could you fit this into an LSTM? Uh, fit, what? fit this architecture into an LSTM to okay. either generate the output or to generate the next state for the, the hidden cells. So when you say fit the architecture, which part of the architecture do you want? All of it. So presumably all of it. The, the so any, state, you're saying dissect it at, at any point in, in the architecture, you want to get a representation and use LSTM on top of it? Putting it inside the LSTM. So, so the LSTM. Like a turducken. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, the question is why? Uh, to say you see, then you would be able to do write a full novels, for instance. Uh, it would generate uh, each key. Co it would generate each word or paragraph uh, or whatever. It would be interesting to see like, if you encoded, you had paragraphs and you somehow encoded them into an LSTM. In theory, you could have a. Uh, a sense of progression of the telling the story. It's interesting. Somebody, if someone wants to work on that, let me know. <laughs> I have a request for you. Or stacked versions back, of that. Back from the, uh, the, 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 the block of concrete idea or block of clay. Mm. In your version, could you flip the sign of that block and tell us what you get? So, the so if the model com is completely does not care what this thing is completely, then if you flip the sign, you don't change the. You, well, assuming your sigma mu is zero and sigma is zero and sigma is one, uh, of that block yep. of concrete. Yep. If you generate it from a distribution, then if you just move it across, uh, every, it should be the same. You, know, you, you flip every sign of every uh, coordinate. Uh, after it's been trained, after uh, it has if been you trained. were to tr switch out that anchor, yeah, uh, just try. Know what you're gonna get? Just try. Yeah, it. I, like, I, I think it would have a major impact because that's al like altering the foundation yeah. of the rest of the network. I'm, I'm also not sure if there are signs. That, like, I'm not, I'm not sure if they do have negative va values in them. Um, okay, uh, do some, 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 oper some deterministic operation yeah. that wouldn't, yeah. that isn't variant. It'd be super Some cool operation see. under which the original uh, distribution from which you sampled it is invariant. So, so for Gaussian, it's flipping the sign. Or, or taking another sample from the same Gaussian. Right? So the first operation that you get coming out from that block is an in operation. And you remove the mean and you divide by the variance. So you take another sample that has the same mean as the variance, you should get the same information going sure. through. I have a somewhat 
uh, uh, random questions. question that may or may not be related to whether that is an image or not. Okay. Uh, could you go to this uh, this um, slide again? Is that is that one? Yeah. So just a random observation. Um, how does it know that guys with that kind of skin tone and that kind of hair usually have beards. Is that like beards? Where are you? Mm -hmm. Where does in that the come left, from? Top left, left in the inside, like yeah. top, 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 top left here. Mm -hmm. Exactly, because the only place that beards show up is is the, where yeah, you have that doesn't the come from here. It doesn't image. come from here. Well, it, it would mean yeah, darker haired people. It, it would you would right. expect that it would know that darker haired people are more likely to have it, beards. It's, it's true. In in reality, like you would you would find the larger percentage of, of guys looking like that having beard, right? <laughs> I'm not sure if that's the reality. I, I, I'm not sure if that's the reality, but it might be true of the data set. Yeah. Yes, that could that's reflect that. That's very interesting because it's not coming from here. And it's not coming from well, the source here. does have a scalpel. And if it is, yes, it is I'm it's just saying, if it, is, if it is paying attention to a very fine detail in the source, it might possibly come from well, with that with the black hair because it does all blend together in the produced picture. Well, it could also be that we got everything wrong. And this is not really an image, but this is a set of images mm. that share the same <laughs> style, and then what you encode here is the actual style. So you have an example here. Here you could have an example of that style. It's just a sample from that style, but in reality what the network has encoded is the actual style. It could be the case. Maybe yeah. Well, it's more sense to call it later in space. Yeah. If that's the case. Yes, yes. The naming makes more sense. Makes more sense. Yeah, that could yeah. be a... So I, I think of, it's a Z. So, so here... Sorry, I'm going back. There. So here it would be actually the, the, the actual... Not one, but it would be the actual style for that particular. So you have a bunch of images that all look the same. And that would be the latent Z here. And that would make sense. Nonetheless... <laughs> no, 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 I'm, I'm not going backwards. I, okay. What I'm saying is that... It doesn't matter. Nonetheless, that latent space you're learning from real images. Mm -hmm. Yes. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter either way. To yeah, be completely yeah. honest with you, pedagogically, I actually like thinking of that as an image better. It's just easier to understand. It's way easier but to understand. When you have cases like the one you showed us, it makes sense that it's uh, something like this. Okay, we just have time for one last question. Go ahead. To add more complexity, they actually say you have Z1 and Z2. Yeah, so, so Z1 and Z2 is yeah. Z1 and Z2. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So that's, that's the way. Is that during training or during? They do it both. No, 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 they, is, do, they do both. This, this, yes, actually, you're right. They do it both because in the paper they talk about mixing stars mm -hmm. to avoid uh, learning the, the correlation between them. Yeah. But so, the interesses are more interesting when you actually train them and switch the the word in the middle of the synthesis. Yeah, and if you if, if we do if you were to go back to the Oh, 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 oh. That's why this guy has a beard. Because you're switching during during training, good catch. That makes sense. So these are images. Yeah, uh, I mean, but, but anyway, right? the, the, sense, right? they do it during training and and that's why I think the last the last um, augmentation when they're showing Frechette scores. Um, you'll notice that the Frechette score actually increases when they do it during training. Or, or no, it gets worse when you do it during training, actually. Uh, and the pitch is that um, when you are teaching the thing to like separate out like how different um, uh, the mixing, when you're including the mixing effectively, it's making the underlying latent space way more complicated. Um, and so you can't, it's not being captured properly or something. Anyway. This is a fascinating work, and what makes it more fascinating is the simplicity of the ideas and how you can take something like that and implement it. And we don't have the resources that NVIDIA has, but, but nonetheless, this is something that it's, you know, we can apply in our work. Hi, everybody. Welcome to TDLS. I'm Lindsay. I'm one of the members of the steering committee. If you liked the video you just saw, Subscribe to our YouTube channel and you'll be the first to find out about every video we put out.